Where there is light, shadows lurk and fear reigns. Yet, by the blades of nights, mankind was given hope. Hello, everybody, and welcome to October. I'm Hi C, and this is Toku Rev, your introduction to tokusatsu movie and TV shows to help you decide what you want to spend your time watching. For the season that encourages everyone to dress up as both heroes and monsters, I'm starting my jump into the Garo series. The Human Heart where darkness always finds a way. As long as humans are impure, horrors will feed. Horrors come from the Makai, a demon world, using objects that represent our corruption as Inga gates, doorways that connect the Makai world to our own. Some horrors take complete control of their victims, while others form symbiotic relationships, helping them live out their dark desires. Once somebody becomes a host, their only salvation is death. <laughs> The only defense we have from horrors are the Makai Knights, developed in secret by the priests of the Makai Order. The Makai Knight Corps was developed to stop and kill the horrors that priests couldn't handle with martial arts and magic alone. Knights are trained from children to control their yin and yang at all times, keeping their emotions subdued, giving them the ability to wield soul metal. Soul metal responds to the wielder's strengths and thoughts. Those untrained who come in contact with soul metal will burn. Without the trained discipline of a Makai Knight, a small piece of soul metal cannot even be lifted. Even those trained are not immune to the properties of soul metal. A knight can only wear their immaculate soul metal armor for 99.9 .9 seconds before it starts to burn away the wearer. Knights are given territories or zones to protect. They are not to travel into another knight's zone without their consent. Each zone has a watchdog who delegates missions and gives orders. This is where the Makai Knights cleanse their blades of horrors. Horrors cannot be killed, but they can be trapped inside of objects, inhibiting their return to the Makai world. Our protagonist, Koga, is a member of the Makai Knights and also holds the prestigious title of Garo. Noting him as incredibly disciplined and skilled, Koga has one mission in life, destroy all horrors. Koga is not sociable, keeping his feelings behind a facade and presenting an emotionless stonewalled face. He is a fierce warrior and has dedicated his life to stopping horrors, but little else. Like other protagonists I've talked about on Toku Rev, Koga is bland. He's uninteresting because he's overly serious and only concerned with defeating horrors. While he has a noble heart, he doesn't fight horrors to save humanity. That's a byproduct. He fights them out of a sense of honor. He comes from a long line of Makai Knights. This is his duty. Thankfully, the show does ask, what is the point of duty without purpose? This doesn't make him interesting, but it does make him more than just a guy killing bumps in the night. Since the Makai armor can only be worn for 99.9 .9 seconds, Koga does a lot of fighting untransformed. When using his Makai sword, Koga feels like a threat. His untransformed fight scenes are well choreographed, and he feels powerful. Defeating smaller horrors with ease, but when he needs extra protection and more power, Koga swirls his sword in a circle above his head and transforms into the Golden Knight Garo. The armor of Garo just feels right. It goes excellent with the tone of the show. A shining, glowing knight in the face of darkness. The wolf motif of the Makai Knights looks fierce. Fight scenes as the knight are fast-paced, and being reminded that there is a countdown to how long Koga can remain in his armor helps put a little tension into the fight scenes. Garo's main finishing technique is called the Flaming Armament lighting his sword on fire, increasing its strength. Koga always feels powerful outside of the armor, so it serves its purpose well. It feels like a boost and not like a costume doing the work for him. Unfortunately, the transformed fights use a lot of CG modeling. 
but I'll go more into detail on that when we talk about production. Koga is equipped with Zaruba, a Maduga, a sentient piece of jewelry serving as an advisor to the Makai Knights. Zaruba is the closest thing to a friend Koga has, able to detect close by horrors and give Koga a heads up. He gives both advice and warnings to Koga, and narratively serves to help the viewer understand the rules inside the world of Garo. He helps explain how certain horrors came to be, and gives the viewer insight to the overall plot. Zaruba is a fun, sarcastic character, helping make the brooding Koga a lot more tolerable. In the first episode, we're introduced to Karu, a starving artist who is about to get her big break by having her artwork featured in an art gallery. Unfortunately for her, this gallery is owned by a man recently possessed by a horror, and he plans to make her his next meal. Saved by Koga and ordered to run, Karu is reminded of the golden knight her artist father drew in an unfinished children's book. Hoping to learn more about her father and the mystery surrounding his last work before he died, she stays and watches Koga defeat the horror, only to be bathed in horror's blood upon Koga's final blow. Zaruba informs both Koga and the audience that anyone bathed in horror's blood will attract horrors and ultimately become one after a hundred days have passed. Going on to tell Koga he must give Karu a mercy killing. But Karu reminds Koga of his mother, leading him to spare her life and making the excuse that he's going to keep tabs on her and use her as bait to attract the other horrors. I have mixed feelings on Karu as a character. I like her as a plot element, but she is a literal damsel in distress. There is narrative reasoning for this, sure, but she's still in danger almost every episode. She's also really frustrating. The questions the show finally answers towards the end are questions that she really should have been asking in the beginning. She plays a big part in the overarching plot, and she does have some mystery surrounding her, but discovering that never really feels like much of a payoff. There's a romance between her and Koga, and it feels really awkward most of the time. Narratively, the horrors are attracted to her because she's been bathed in horror's blood but it never really feels like that's why she's coming in contact with them. She just kind of stumbles into them in her day-to-day -day search for employment. Karu develops a close family-styled relationship with the Koga's butler, Ganza. Ganza has been Koga's family butler and is the closest thing he has to live in family. He advises Koga when needed and serves to help Karu adjust to living in her new world of horrors and nights. He isn't an important character, but he has a lot of charm, and his care for Koga and Karu is translated well. He would gladly give his life in service of their safety. He's able to lift soul metal to assist knights in battle, but he lacks the discipline to wield one as a weapon. I could have easily gotten away without mentioning Ganza, but while his role is small, he's maybe my favorite character in this series, and I felt like I couldn't leave him out. <laughs> And then, there's Lei, neighbor in Makai Knight and holder of the Silver Fang Zero title. Lei is a bit of a wild card, and his intentions are mysterious throughout the show. He shows a rival affection towards Karu, and is antagonistic to Koga. Unlike Koga, he fights with two smaller swords and almost equal skill and training. After a traumatic past that is left better discovered through the show, Lei prefers the name Zero. Zero has his own Madoga named Silva. Like most secondary Toku characters, he is filled with personality and overly flirtatious, even to Silva. While Koga treats Zaruba as a friend, Zero flirts with Silva like she was his lover. Zero swings his two smaller swords over his head to transform into the Silver Fang armor. Silver Fang armor is very reminiscent of the Garo armor, so most of my opinions really stay the same. While the armors look similar, the two fighting styles are very different. Zero uses his two swords and is much quicker than Garo. There are times when the two fight each other transformed, breaking the Makai law. These fight scenes showcase how the two were trained differently. These are hands down the best fight scenes in the entire series.
So let's talk about production. Like Ultra 7 X, Garo was made for adults. It has a much darker tone to it, and it also shows a little bit of female nudity. At least every episode, somebody dies a bloody death from a horror, and some have multiple body counts. It's from 2005, right before the jump from 4.3 to 16.9, so your newer TVs are not really doing this show any favors. Also not doing the show any favors are the CG creatures from 2005. I've not hidden my dislike for CG creature design, and that probably goes double here since most of the monster designs come in two flavors, practical effects and CG models. I love most of the designs. I can't really think of any that I outright hated. The CG technology just does not do a good job at rendering the ideas that they're trying to use, but I don't hate the concepts in their design. Things like the Inga demons are genuinely a little creepy, and this big creepy clown thing could also be creepy if it didn't look like a bad video game. Almost every episode uses CG models, but it doesn't stop at the monsters. Both Garo and Zero have CG models that get placed in the scenes, and when it's a CG model fighting a CG model, the two forms don't clash as heavily, but whenever they're compositing practical effects and visual effects, the result is always jarring and take me almost completely out of what I'm watching to the point where it becomes really impalatable and I almost stop paying attention. And the CG doesn't stop with the creatures and animated objects. It also uses a lot of 3D objects that just look horribly dated. When you see a generic car or a train that doesn't even belong to this continent, it can be pretty silly. The show's format is a little interesting. It spends a lot of time each episode developing the monsters. It takes time to give them a backstory and doesn't rush to show you Koga. He's saved to the later half of most episodes, giving you enough time to develop the threats and the lore of each horror. Since horror need to come to our world through gates, they develop objects and the reason they have become corrupted. But sometimes, this comes at the expense of our character development, making the show's pace feel kind of slow. So do I recommend Garo? Well, I was already really intrigued. I had an introduction to the Garo universe through Garo the Animation. When I started Garo the Animation, I didn't know there was a Toku series until I did a little bit of digging. So I was really excited to start this show. And I'm sad to say once I did, I was a little bit disappointed. I liked the monster designs a lot. I liked the hero designs a lot. While there was CG, I didn't hate the fight scenes, but through the first handful of episodes, I was so bored. I was just waiting for a plot to drop. I was waiting so long that I felt like I should stop watching the show, and that's a huge problem. I don't know if this was because they were trying something different with the adult orientation of the show, but it felt really bizarre. The first episode is okay, but then it spends the next nine doing the same thing, and while the monsters were interesting, it was hard for me to really care about generic people dying. Or, uh-oh, Karu went on her fourth job interview with a horror. I bet this won't end the exact same way. All of that made me start to resent the show, and it took me a while to get through it, because it started feeling like a chore. And then Zero came in. And for a second, there was something new going on. There was tension. I was engaged and wanted to know more about him. He starts to get a little rapey with Karu, and that made me uncomfortable. But hey, at least I felt something. And then came another generic episode, and all those feelings were gone. At this point, I felt mad. I knew this series was only 25 episodes long, but I had to talk myself into them to finish this video. In order to do an episode of Toku Rev, I require myself to finish the series. And I'm really glad I have that rule, because once you get to episode 13, titled Promise, you get a recap of everything that happened from episode 1 through 12. And something amazing happens. This becomes a great show. Episode 14 through 25 are great. Every episode introduces a horror while also advancing the plot. Karu is upset with Koga. Zero and Koga are at each other's throats. The secrets of everybody's past are becoming realized. On episode 16, titled Red Sake, Koga sits down with the Makai Priest, and they play a weird game that I don't understand, and just lightly talk about Koga's father and Koga's purpose in fighting horrors. It's a complete forebreak and gives the show all the weight it was missing, setting up lore and future characters, and makes the show really compelling. I can only assume the creators knew the show was failing and made a dramatic shift, but 
But once they do, they salvage this show into something really special. It took me three weeks to watch the first 10 episodes and then a few days to finish off the rest. Koga goes from a man who fights for nobility and duty to one who fights to protect those he cares about. So once more, do I recommend Garo? Yeah, but really only the second half. It feels really weird to suggest this, but I suggest watching the first episode and then skipping to episode 13 and watching the recap and just continue from there. You might miss out on a couple of moments of small character building, but it's not worth watching every episode. But the second half of the show has it so I can't wait to continue this series. So if you're interested in starting a new Toku show, this isn't a bad one to go with, but I do only suggest the second half. Thank you everyone for watching and happy Halloween. In the last episode, I talked about Ultra 7X, who tried to imitate the good parts of the Garo franchise and failed. Next time, I'll be discussing a tokusatsu movie. I want to thank everyone who's been watching these videos and joining the live streams. It's been a really awesome journey so far. Recently, I've joined the voice cast of Ultraman G, the abridged series, featured on Nida Spears channel, playing Ultra Zero. I'll throw a link on screen and in the description. And feel free to hit the playlist of the other Toku Rev episodes. So thank you again. As always, like, comment, and subscribe. And I hope you come back for more Toku introductions.